Well, it is it is good to be back and glad to be able to be here with you uh, this morning. We're going over a lesson this morning about taking responsibility for our actions. Now, lesson a lesson like this is kind of uh, new to me, not necessarily because I've never taken responsibility for my actions, but because we're trying to implement this idea in our home with Reese. Uh, we're, we're trying to show him that uh, in lying and you know, not understanding things and doing things that mommy and daddy say not to, he's getting in trouble. And I, I don't want to present confusion to him. I want him to understand that what we do in our lives, there's always a, a responsibility to be taken. Whether it is a I've done good good and I received good or I've done bad and I received bad, nonetheless learning to take responsibility or another way we would say it is owning up to our mistakes or, or what we're doing in our bodies. It's a concept we need to be teaching and we need to start at a young age. It's a biblical concept as well. As we read this morning in Galatians chapter 6, if you recall over there beginning in verse 7 and in verse 8, the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, therefore shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we see that in this body, in, 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 in front of God and before man, there are things that I can do to reap everlasting life or life everlasting. Or the things that I can do in this body to receive corruption. We're going to look at, it, at about seven things. One of the first things we want to discuss this morning and kind of briefly run through is our actions have consequences. Uh, to, uh, there, there's the old saying and, a, and a, a very true saying, to every action there is a reaction. There's also to every action a consequence or, or, or something that happens. Some of them are insignificant and, and they're temporary. We look at actions that you and I can do today that are insignificant significant and temporary uh, putting which sock you put on first your right one or your left one you know which arm you put through your shirt hole first the right one or the left one uh, you know the actions they're insignificant it doesn't matter as long as you put them on and as long as you get dressed right oh, we, we've accomplished today as long as I can get the church somewhat matching I know I'm not an embarrassment to my wife but if I get to church and I don't match guess what I don't much care if I'm embarrassing her or not. It's insignificant in the grand scheme of things, right? Well, this, you know, having green socks with a red pair of pants, I, I, I'm dressed up like Christmas season, but guess what? It has no significance spiritually for me, and it's not going to bring any sinful or bad consequence. You know, some of the teenagers here might pick at me and laugh at me. Uh, my wife is more than likely going to get told that her husband wore green socks with red pants. But guess what? I'll live. It ain't going to hurt too bad getting picked on. But there are other actions that we can do in this life that are serious and can possibly bring in permanent consequences. We're, we're trying to implement this in Reese's life and brushing his teeth. Oh, it's a nightmare. Uh, I, I've always had teeth problems and everything, and that's because I loved my pacifier and apple juice as a child, and my parents didn't tell me no, so they brought every tooth I had in my head. And then they grew crooked, not straight, etc. You know, you get it. So we're trying to teach Reese, hey, brush your teeth. Oh, it is, it is, it is World War III every night at the house. Whenever one of us got to hold him down, the other one opens up the mouth, and then, you know, we try to get the toothbrush in there. It's rough. You know, at times we, we resort to persuasion and, and, and rewarding. Let me brush your teeth and I, I give you a, a chocolate bar tomorrow or you can you can have some candy. Well, what's the point I'm making? If he doesn't brush his teeth, what is the consequence that is serious and possibly permanent in the future that's going to happen? Well, he ain't going to have no teeth if he don't brush them. But if he does brush them, there is a permanent thing that can happen. His teeth will be healthy. Some choices. And it's the choices we really want to focus in on today. Though we can make lessons about insignificant choices and, and permanent serious choices, I want to look at eternal actions that we're doing today. What we're doing in our bodies each and every day, going through life that is preparing us 
for an eternity somewhere. I, I pray this morning, and I hope that the actions we find ourselves doing, or you know, the life that we are living today, is preparing us for an eternal home in heaven. That's my prayer. That's my hope. I want to see my brethren in heaven with me. I'm afraid, however, and it's an unfortunate thing to have to discuss, some of us are living lives and doing things in those lives that are preparing us for an eternal life of damnation. It's not something we want to talk about, nor something we want to say that we enjoy. However, we're going to notice that in learning to take responsibility for our actions, the first thing we have to realize and come to understand is your actions have consequences. Can you think biblically of individuals who had actions that led to eternal consequences? One of the first people that comes to my mind in Genesis chapter 3, I made some fill in the blank for you this morning. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 11 and going through verse 13, one of the first actions in the Bible that brought forth consequences that led to an eternal way, uh, you know, understanding that it brought in sin to the world was who? Well, we would fill it in with Adam and Eve, right? Turn, turn over there and let's look at it this morning. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 11 and going through verse 13, we classify it as the fall of mankind. The, the law given in Genesis 2 and the temptation shown in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. We get to verse 6 and we see that the woman saw the tree, saw how it was good, it pleased her, she ate, she gave to her husband. Beginning in Genesis 3, at verse 11, the Bible reads, And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Wherefore I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat. And the man said, The woman... Whom thou gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. One thing we notice, even from children up into adults, is we always want to blame others for our mistakes. Do we not? Who took the cookie from the cookie jar? You remember that song as a kid? What, what would, do, do you understand the, the whole concept of it? Well, one, it was hopefully motivating children to be honest and not dishonest, but the whole song passes blame to the next person. Only oh, it's fun. It's catchy. Sure it is. But all it is is passing blame. You know, Mike took the cookies. No, Chris did. No, Kevin did. Well, somebody tell the truth, quit blaming others, and who took the cookie from the cookie jar? Well, who ate of the tree? Who told you you were naked, Adam? Well, the woman. The woman gave me the fruit and I ate. It's her fault. And remember, you gave me the woman, God, so ultimately it's your fault. Well, it goes to the woman. The woman, who, who gave it to you? Well, the serpent tricked me. I ate it. But remember, God, you created all. You, you done it all. You placed us here. You put this before us. Who's ultimately, whose fault was it for the actions that happened in Genesis 3 in the garden? Adam and Eve. What's not God's fault? The serpent, though he was beguiling and cunning, it was not his fault. He was not the one that ate of the fruit. It was Adam. And it was Eve. We, we move on and we look in Exodus chapter 32. Turn over here with me, if you will. Exodus chapter 32. And we have another blank that we got to fill in this morning of individuals in the scriptures that done something but tried to play and pass the blame. Exodus 32, we have Israel with the golden calf. If you recall, he, Moses comes down from the mountain, sees the nation with the golden calf, Aaron there in the midst of the people, and we get to Exodus 32, beginning at verse 21, and he says, Aaron, what's going on? Why, why is all this happening? Paraphrasing, of course. Why, why are we building an image before our God? Verse 21. What did the, this people unto thee that thou hast brought such a great sin upon them? Aaron said, let not thy anger of, of the Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, and they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods. Oh, oh, hold on now. Before you go to whooping somebody, don't whoop me. It wasn't my fault. I mean, it was the people. And they told me to. They brought it to me. They said, You do this. Whose fault was it that it got built? It was Aaron. He was in the position of authority. He was before the people. He had the power to say, we're not going to do it. And instead, he 
helped gather the gold and he helped make the calf. Whenever we learn to take responsibility for our actions, we have to realize that we cannot sit there and blame others for our mistakes. Or the, well, he is the one who started it. That was one of my favorite lines in elementary school and middle school. When getting in trouble before the teacher and before our parents, well, technically, you know, he started it. What was the next what was the next phrase that came out of their mouth? Well, they may have started it, but I'm finishing it. Is, is that not how, and, and biblically, we see God dealing with these situations? Well, Adam and Eve, you know, you've done this, you've done that. That's fine. It's not acceptable. But here's what we're going to do about it, and we see punishment. Aaron, you know, all the people made me, and I've done it. Well, okay, not acceptable. Here's punishment. Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, they offered strange fire, and God said to them, I will be glorified. Right? That's fine. I'm ending it here. And we see that to be the case. The devil is just so strong, I just feel so helpless against him, right? There's just nothing I can do. It, sin just happens. James 4 verse 7 says there is something you can do. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 16. The Bible says today as Christians we can put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. There is things and there are things that you and I can do. But instead we like to sit back and point the finger. We move on. Number, number three, a third thing when learning to take responsibility for our actions, we need to realize that other ways folks try to cover up and their mistakes and their failures, right? What, what's one of the go-to things when, when caught with trouble? What, what, what do they do? People today, people throughout history, they lie. Oh, there's, you know, there's nothing, nothing I dislike more than a liar and a thief, right? There's no need for it. Honesty and truth is what's righteous and pleasing before God. Lying about it, notice a faithful witness will not lie. But a fault witness will other lie. Proverbs 14 at verse 5. They'll point out that other people are doing the same thing to try and justify their actions. You, you recall people like this? Well, you know, so-and-so down the road, he's doing it. They're doing it, so I figured, well, if they're doing it, it's got to be all right, so I'll do it too. Does that justify sin amongst two people? Absolutely not. That just shows ignorance amongst two people that they believe that they can sin before God and it be acceptable and okay. Proverbs 28 verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. However, whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall obtain or have mercy. Friends, in a life like today, before God, who is unchanging and everlasting. I want mercy. In, in order to attain heaven, in order to be found righteous before God, I have to have mercy. Otherwise, I'm not making it there. I have to realize that what I'm doing in my body, in this life, I am responsible for. If I'm going out acting like a fool and being part of the world instead of giving my body to God, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Oh man, I'm going to I'm going to regret it. Number four, uh, I want to notice something, and it, it, it's not talked about a lot, but it should be. If I am a mature enough as a Christian, that I'm old enough to take responsibility for my actions. Does that make sense? If, if I was able and, and found mature enough to become a Christian, a child of God, understanding what I'm doing and obeying the gospel, obeying it and starting my Christian walk, I am old enough. To take responsibility for my actions. Too many times, and we find this in preteens, teenagers, and young young adults, we, we, we give them what they call a cop out. We, we give them a way of escape, leniency. Well, they're, they're still young. It's said in my house with my three year old, and I'm not being mean or anything, but he's still a baby. I don't care if he's still a baby. He's getting big enough to know right and wrong, and he's getting big enough to start to open. You know, well, he's just three. He's just a baby. That's fine. I won't whoop him as hard as I would a 13 or 14-year-old. But nonetheless, it's time for discipline. 
It's time for correction. Whenever we allow our possible preteens and teenagers who are, you know, Christians, they've done the things necessary to attain salvation, they've been added to the Lord's church, we allow them the leniency to go and mingle with sin in the world. Not only are we doing them a disservice as parents and guardians and helping promote sin in their lives, what are we doing? Whenever they do fall short and we cover it up, we're saying your actions it doesn't matter. They have no consequences. You go do what you want. Live the life you want. Mommy and daddy. Grandma and grandpa will take care of it. That's not how life works. And, and whenever they go out and they start enduring and going through the real world, they're going to have a rude awakening whenever they realize that they were pampered and baby. And here's the real world. We're not preparing people to take responsibility of their actions. And I'm not just picking on preteens and teenagers this morning. There are adults who are 50, 60, 40, 70 year old that guess what? They still are children and cannot take responsibility for their actions. It's sad. It's a biblical concept shown time and time again. Whenever we look in places like Psalms 32. Let's go over there if you will. Psalms chapter 32. We can also look at the account in 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21 beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 8 when looking at this fill in the blank that we're going to have. But we're going to look at Psalms 32. Psalms 32 beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 5. A psalm of David. Uh, here the Bible begins and says, Blessed is he who... Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no God. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my, through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Pause and think about what he's saying. There was a time in his life where he kept silence. He didn't say anything about the actions that were going on. And his life was tough. His life was hard. Go to verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, God. What did he do? If you go through and look at the life of David, there was time in his life, a time period where he was sinning. And he was sinning. And he was sinning. Friends came to him. And they told him about a man. And he said that man needed, needed surely to be put to death. And they said, it's you, David. And what did he acknowledge? He acknowledged his sin. He took responsibility for his actions. Finish verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. My iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And now forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now compare the two lives. I'm living a life and I'm hiding everything, not taking responsibility, and man is life terrible. I acknowledge what I'm doing wrong. I get right with God and just raise. What is he thinking about? He's thinking about how much better his life is now that he's taking responsibility for what he's doing. David done it. Many individuals done it. Let's go to the next one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If there's a New Testament individual who time and time again his life was brought up and shown by the things that he done or should not have done and how he owned those and changed, it had to be Paul. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 9. Uh, 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 give an account there in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8. Of Paul or Saul before he became Paul going and persecuting the church. He says here in 1 Corinthians 15 and 9, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. Well, why? What did you do? Well, he said, Because I persecuted the church or persecuted the church of God. What did he do to New Testament Christianity there in Acts 7 and Acts 8 to the people and to the church? Well, at times he killed them. At times he persecuted him. He threw him into prison. He was chasing him. He was going after him. But now backtrack with me. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And look with me at verse 27. Upon owning his mistakes, what did he do? 
Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest by any means what I, what I have preached unto others, I myself should become a castaway. Not only did he own his mistakes, he realized that there was a way to conduct and keep his bodies so that way he didn't fall again, as we see there in Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 2. We've got to give a more honesty to the things which we had heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Because what? We cannot escape if we neglect so great a salvation. We need to be repenting. We need to be praying. We need to be confessing our sins before God. Acts chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. Turn over with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3. Look with me at verses uh, 12 and 13. And when looking at being a mature Christian, old enough to take responsibility of our actions, there is another side to that. When others come to me and admit to wrongdoing, I should... If I'm a Christian, if I'm a child of God, I should be loving and big enough, if you will, to realize that God's family forgives and forgets. We let it go. We, we move on. Notice Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. The Bible reads, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercy. Right? We, we, we keep reading kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, longsuffering. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Taking responsibilities for actions also shows how whenever others try to do it before us, how we are to accept it because we are part of God's wonderful family and we forgive. Number five. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest points, and a point probably many sitting here this morning were waiting, is the reason I need to take responsibility for my actions is because the Lord holds me accountable for my actions or my choices. I need to realize and take responsibility for them because there's coming a day, judgment day, that I'm going to give an account for what I've done in this body and based off of what I've done in the account that I give is going to determine where I spend eternity. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 14 God's going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil with the goodness being rewarded with heaven and the evil being punished with hell friends I have to realize what I'm doing in this life there are consequences whatsoever a man soweth therefore shall he also reap 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 well guess what you can take responsibility for me I'm going to keep letting my parents cover it up. I'm going to keep living how I want to. And then, come that day, you've heard it said before, I'm just, me and the big man upstairs, we have an understanding. I'm going to, I'm going to go up there and plead my case before Almighty God. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may, what, give an account? That everyone may argue, give their case? No, friends. When this day comes, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, we will receive the things done in our body according to what we've done, whether it was good or bad. You're not going to go up there and discuss anything with God. You're not going to go up there and plead a case. You're not going to get to, as they say, weasel your way out of another situation. What you've done... God's going to reward you with such. Number six. We're almost done. I, I thank you for your attention. Number six. When, when understanding and realizing taking responsibility for my actions, I need to, in order to be able to do that, I need to ask what I need. Number one, I need integrity. Uh, yes, I did it, or yes, I am the one who forgot to do it. The, the realization and the admitting that, yes, I made the mistake, I am at fault, I am to blame. We see the psalmist going through it all the time, do we not? He says, I acknowledge my transgressions before thee, O God. I know I made the mistake. It, the, it, the Ezekiel writer, the, the punishment of sin falls upon who? The soul that sins. The soul that sins, Ezekiel 18, it shall surely die. The father cannot bear the iniquity of the son, neither the mother of the daughter. We, we realize the one who sins, the one who makes the mistakes, is the one who pays for it. I need to have a contrite spirit. I need to have humility and courage. It's not easy to own up to our mistakes. But I need to have the courage 
the integrity, the humility, and the right kind of heart to where if I do make them, I, I make the change as well. Number seven. When coming to the end of the lesson and looking at how do I take responsibility for my action, I need to realize that I need to take the initiative on my own to do certain things. To every action, there is a reaction. You and I will give an account for what we've done in our body. We see that in Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And whatever man soweth, therefore shall we also read Galatians chapter 6. Today, you need to be responsible. You need to be dependable in everything that you do. You need to be an honest individual. Whenever we're looking at my life before God and taking the initiative to do these things, my Bible study and my prayer life before Him has to be correct. I have to do the things God would have me to do. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, James chapter 5. Uh, pure religion to be righteous before God. Turn over to James chapter 1 and notice that the initiative that has to be taken on the individual. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, James 1 at verse 27. To visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep yourself or himself unspotted from the world. There, there are individuals who need visits. There are people who need help taken care of. Oh, whoa, well, now. Preacher? I have a lot of work to do. I ain't got that much time. But whenever I find time, I try to do it. Why? That's what a Christian does. That's what one who wants to be pleasing before God does. We, we read there in Galatians chapter 6 and shown the point that in verse 2 our responsibility is to help each other, bear each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. I need to be taking these steps and these initiatives to a righteous way of living before God. Otherwise, I'll never mature enough to be able to take responsibility for my actions. This morning, I want to ask you if you have taken one of the biggest steps in admitting mistakes and taking responsibility for your actions. Uh, obeying the gospel. Realizing that you have sin in your lives. You're separate and apart from God. You're not a member of the Lord's church. And realizing what a mistake that is and wanting to come to the Lord. You must hear, believe, repent, confess. You must be baptized for the forgiveness of sins where you're uh, you rise to walk in the newness of life, leaving that old man of sin behind, taking responsibility for your actions and saying that now you're going to live a life for Christ, Galatians 2 at verse 20. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, a child of God, but you've seen it. Sin has came back into your life. You've separated from the one who loved you first, and you realize that, and you want to make things right. You want to admit mistakes and take responsibility. Well, the invitation is yours. Come back home. Repent and pray that the thought of thine heart may be forgiven of thee. If in a public manner and you need to do it publicly, come forward as we get ready to, do, to stand up and sing. But if in a private manner, as we get ready to sing heaven's invitation, extend the invitation and sing the hymn, handle, handle it privately at the pew if need be, friends. This morning, make sure we're taking correct responsibility and doing the things that would be pleasing unto God. We can help you in any way. We love you and we care for you. Come forward now as together we stand as we stand.